So hey everyone, we're gonna get started. Um, I'm Ron Cavanaugh, Executive Director of the Literary Freedom Project. Um, we have partnered with one, excuse me, uh, the book club is One Book, One Bronx. And we've partnered with uh, the Casita Maria Center for Arts and Education to really develop um, a community around books and reading and discussions, and discussions that sort of broaden who we are, hopefully inform you know, our, our thinking, kind of broaden that, or what you bring to the book club, you know, helps other people sort of explore ideas and cultures and histories through books and reading. Um, tonight, uh, Janet Rucker is here. She is with um, the Casita Maria Center for Arts and Education. And they're, they're having their big um, program of the year, the South Bronx Cultural Trail. Uh, I'm gonna let Janet say a few words about that and anything else she likes to talk about tonight. Janet? Great, thank you so much, Ron. Um, as Ron mentioned, my name is Janet Rucker. I'm the Creative Arts Manager for Casita Maria. I work very closely with Gail Heidel to help uh, produce all the programs that we're doing this season. Um, so normally uh, we would be in our gallery space at the Casita Maria building. Um, we have a sixth floor gallery. Um, if you haven't been able to visit us, we do have a new show that opened in April called Grafitera Estamos Aquí. Um, it's two brilliant uh, female street artists who are both Bronx natives. Um, it's really interesting if you wanna see it. We're actually having a reception tomorrow night, Thursday from 5.30 to 8.00. It is timed entry, but it is free. So I'll put a link in the chat so that you can sign up if you'd like to see it. Um, if there's another time that works better, please feel free to email me and I'll schedule an appointment with you directly. Um, I also wanna let you guys know about um, more about the South Bronx Cultural Trail, which is starting on Saturday. We have our first event. It's from five to 7 p.m. at Playground 52. We have our house Latin jazz band Bronx Banda that will be performing with the New York Philharmonic. So also in the chat, I put a link to the South Bronx Cultural Trail so you can see all the events we have going on through the month of June. Um, so thank you so much for having me here. It's really great to see all of you um, and have a good book club. Bravo. Thank, thank you, you Maria. Janet. Thank you, Janet. Um, and you can also uh, definitely follow the, follow the link, but they're at casitamaria.org. Um, and I know all the information is there. Um, so they've been an excellent partner in supporting us in the book club. So thank you again, um, Janet from Casita Maria Center for Arts and Education. Um, up next, we are going to start our exploration through um, uh, When I Was Puerto Rican by uh, El Morel de Santiago. Um, our facilitator for this book club, uh, once again, after a brief vacation, is uh, Brandon Janice. Bravo. Uh, so Brandon will be leading tonight's conversation. Brandon. Thank you, Ron. It's so good to see all of y'all again. I feel like this is a, a bit of a family reunion. Um, you know, I was wondering, I hate to put anyone on the spot, um, but if anyone is, a Spanish speaker, Spanish native speaker. I was wondering if someone would volunteer to read the um, part of the poem at the beginning. If you don't have it, um, I could send it to you, but is anyone interested? You can just unmute yourself. Anybody? Wait, you said two things. You said Spanish speaker or fluent? You don't have to be fluent, <laughs> but maybe, uh, maybe native. <laughs> No, um, there's just that poem at the beginning yeah. that I was wondering if we could hear it in, in Spanish. Ana? I, I would do it unless there's somebody that's really, really Spanish speaking. No? Come on, Anne, I'll do it. I'll do it, I'll do it. All right, let's do it. I was a bilingual teacher my first two years of teaching and the kids corrected me all the time, so. <laughs> okay, you qualify. <laughs> okay, okay let me try it. This is a, a poem by Luis Llorens Torres. El bojío de la loma bajo sus alas de paja siente el fresco maña, mañarero y abre sus ojos al alba. 
Vuela el pájaro del nido, brinca el gallo de la rama. A los beceros aislados de las tetas de las vacas. Les corre por el hocico leche de la madrugada. Las mariposas pululan, rubí, zapa, oro, plata. Floros, flores huérfanas que rondan buscando a las madres ramas. The definition is right below. <laughs> so. Thank you so much. I, um, that was so beautiful to me. Even, um, you know, usually things get lost in translation or usually sometimes when you read them and even read the translation, it doesn't, you just somehow know it doesn't sound as beautiful in English as it does in Spanish. But this, um, even in English and in Spanish, this was, these words were just so beautiful to me. Um, you know, I reading these first few pages, the first 60 pages, I think we read. There was something, I want to know what y'all think about this, um, especially people who are from the islands, any islands from the Caribbean or, or were raised by parents from the Caribbean. I, um, I went to the new school and I had this teacher, um, her name was Tiffany Yanni. And she's like a famous writer now. Yay, Tiffany. And yeah, she was my, she was one of my professors. And um, she, she's from the islands. She's from uh, Jamaica, I think, or- St. Croix. St. Croix. And I remember she would kind of like break out into um, these like random uh, stories she would tell us about St. Croix. Or St. Thomas. It's either St. Thomas or St. Croix. It's one of the islands. Yeah. The Virgin and, Islands. I think it was St. Thomas. And she, I remember her telling us this story about the bananas on the island and how the bananas in St. Thomas are so sweet. They, they're, they're like a delicacy. They're, they're insanely sweet. And when you come here and eat a banana, it's almost like eating water to her. She, I remember her saying that. <laughs> and she would she would tell these stories about these like old folk stories about children stealing bananas and climbing up trees to eat them and then getting found out because their like hands were so sticky because the bananas were so sweet and that story kind of reminded me of the the first chapter that we read where the author is describing fruit and she's talking about how in Puerto Rico they are very sweet and delicious and even when they're sour you still eat them when, they, when they're not even ripe you know they you still eat them and they're still delicious um whereas kind of compared to her experience at the stop and shop where she's going through the guavas and and you can kind of just tell it's not the same <laughs> right and it's almost that idea of um being a in that idea of, of maybe childhood and adulthood your your blood is still the same your veins are still the same your skin is still the same you still have the same eyes as when you were a child you may uh you have the same nose you have the same body but it's not the same right as when you're in adulthood it's bittersweet once you become an adult nothing's black and white anymore it's all gray um and i was just wondering what did y'all like what do you what do y'all think about that idea of kind of how she she starts the novel with that comparison with fruit, fruit in the islands versus fruit at the stop and shop. Surely there's still two pieces of fruit that were grown from a similar seed, if not the same seed, but they're very, very different. What do y'all think about that? Does that make sense? Yes. It does. And it's funny because it's probably the only thing I've read. So I'm gonna contribute half now and just shut up. <laughs> <laughs> um, it's funny. Um, because she's describing the guava and um, it kind of sort of reminded me of my mom, right? When she describes the fruit in Honduras, like to me, a mango is a mango, right? Um, and I know, I know the differences here, but when she talks about the different mangoes that you find in Honduras, and we have a mango tree in Honduras and it fall, like around springtime and she's like, if the mango is dulce and then my aunt has a different type of mango and this type of mango and that type of mango 
And I'm like, a mango is a mango. But the way my mom talks about fruits like that she's had in Honduras, and I don't know, maybe it's an American thing, me growing up as an American, I don't know. But when she talks about it, and my sister, my sister moved to the States when she was 12, when she talks about certain fruits that you find in maybe particular to Honduras, it's not the same experience um, growing it in your own land as opposed to just going to a fruit stand or something like that. The only equivalent for me for that, to a certain extent, being you know the gringa like or the Yankee when you when you go back home is the sugar cane. Like my grandfather grew sugar cane on our land, and that was the highlight of my summer. Every time I went to Honduras, I, it you know it was just getting the sugar cane and my grandfather taking a machete and going at it. So just opening up the book this way it resonates with the stories that my mom tells me. She doesn't think about it like in the sense of leaving Honduras, but there's something about that attachment to the fruit and, and to the land in particular, right? Because she's not talking about shopping for it. She's talking about it being on the land. So that's my two cents. Bye y'all. Yes, yes. Um, Jessica, you wanna say Annette, are you uh, you're speaking? You're muted. I'm sorry. I'm uh, new. I'm just new to this, but I was just kind of I have the book up on the side here and I was just kind of reading a little bit of it. But I read oh, I'm sorry. I thought you were speaking. I'm, I was just kind of trying to read a little bit of it, but I'm just new here. I, I love this book. I love this author and I thought I just would join because it's, you know, she's we she's amazing. she's an amazing author. Thank you for joining us. <clears throat> and I read this book 20, you know, 1993 when it was released, I was 20 years old. And having grown up in the city, um, it was, you know, very sweet and sad yeah. and emotional. So I'm getting a little <laughs> emotional about it, actually. So well, we're, just, we're just getting started. So if you're getting emotional now, <laughs> I can't get all waterworks, but <laughs> it just it just brings me back yeah. to you know being young, a young woman. So, yeah. and I spent a lot of time in Puerto Rico too. So, there you go. Hey, Brendan. Hi, everyone. <laughs> For me, it was hard to even get past this entire section on guavas because I feel it's really saying something more than what I'm getting. And then, uh, you know, so much personification utilized in this particular passage. Um, it's all of her senses. You know, she equates it to uh, guava was been a child. Uh, and in America, apples and pears, I think, was been an adult. So I reread, I read this like, I don't know how many times. I couldn't get past it because I know that it's symbolic of a little bit more within the book, uh, but I don't really know what. Um, I've called my friends who are, are Puerto Rican, so I'm like, what does this mean? And, you know, they've told me what guava is and how as children, it seemed to be really like a, a fruit on the table, such as apples would be on our tables in America or whatever. So I just want to know what it means and how it's going to be symbolic as we go throughout the book. Yeah, same here. Yes, Ms. Evelyn. Hi, everybody. I'm so pleased to be back uh, to the book club. Um, I happen to be in Puerto Rico. I've been here for the past six months. So um, when I saw that this was the offering for, for this uh, time around, I, I jumped at the chance. Like Danette, I read this book when it first came out and, you know, I, I can still cry <laughs> about it. Um, the guava, the way she described the guava, it's like I could taste it in my mouth. Um, the description is it's just so, so descriptive. Um, but, you know, when you eat a fruit back in, I'm from the Bronx. If you eat a, a fruit back home, I mean, it's had to travel on a boat. It's had to be frozen. It has to be, you know, so what you, what your end product is not going to be like right now I can go outside and pick a mango out the tree or pick a, a guava and and I'll have it fresh from the tree. And that's a totally different taste. So I can really relate to what she was saying about the differences in the taste. Um, you're not going to have this, the same sabor that you're going to get from a, a 
fruit that has been transported 3,000 miles away, uh, and, and there is a difference. Um, so that's my two cents about the guava. Thank That's what the big thing. The big thing here is that you they use the guava, they make a paste out of it. So if you've ever been to a Puerto Rican Christmas party and you see the pieces of white cheese with the guava yeah. paste, you know that's guava. Ooh. Ooh. <laughs> yes, Lord. That's my yeah. favorite snack. <laughs> That is with the my Ritz favorite crackers. set. With the yes! Crackers, yeah. Girl, you talking too. dirty to me right now. <laughs> yes! Oh, yes. Manta. It's Manta, me, you know. You know, it it's me. It sounds delicious. Como? It sounds delicious. It's delicious. It is delicious. It comes I, in a uh, tin can, I think, right? The Goya one but comes yeah, in but a that's tin not, can. Yeah. I know that's not like the real that one, but you know. <laughs> the poorer you are, the poorer you are. That's kind of the one you can get, right? <laughs> I, I had to actually look in the dictionary for the for a picture of a guava because the way she was describing it, I'm like, I never saw that here before. <laughs> but I had, you know, and I'm like, damn. You know what? I kind of had that like same moment where I was like, wait, I know what a guava <laughs> is, but it sounds like she might be describing a mango or like uh, an alfalfa yeah. mango, like what we have in Michigan. Um, so yeah, I had that same yeah. that same moment, and also just kind of piggybacking. I want to, you know anybody else to jump in here too, but also piggybacking on what Miss Sherry said. You know when she was talking about the guava, I had to kind of go back and try to pick up on a lot of the imagery, but also a lot of the uh, things that weren't said, things that weren't written. And one thing that I really I want to know what y'all think about is um, there's a line where she. She says something about, ah, it's the last paragraph. Actually, it's the very last paragraph of the first chapter. And she says, the guava joins its sister under the harsh fluorescent lights of the exotic fruit display. And I was like, ooh, that's a big line. Something, that something is in there. And then we read just a little further and find out that not only does um, the author introduce a sister right maggie is it maggie i think her name's maggie but also um that idea of kind of like this exotic fruit being under fluorescent lights and maggie moving to new york you know from pr to new york that idea of like something exotic going under something fluorescent new york city bright lights big city bright fluorescent lights um, and then being sisters, I kind of got that, a little bit of that connection there, but I still think there's so many layers mm -hmm. um, of why she chose a guava, and more specifically to her story, but why she chose to talk about it and the texture and the color so, so, so deeply in these first few pages. Well, she's comparing it to American fruits, because in that later on in the chapter where the Americans introduce breakfast and the, the food chart and the hygienic chart and all that, how they wanna substitute uh, the actual foods of Puerto Rico with apples. Like, you know, somebody said, can, can, can we eat a mango instead of an apple? You know, so it's like trying to just, you know, disregard any any anything that the Puerto Ricans eat in Puerto Rico as as not good, so screw that. Yeah, mangoes and guavas for everybody. Can I just uh, make a, can I just make a comment about this part? Can I just interject a comment here about what I thought? And I'm rereading it again. Yeah, I without, without crying, all right. I know I was getting all emotional. Um, I just it was it was just such, it's such a touching story to me. But anyway, I my feeling of it, and as I'm rereading it, I always felt that the guava that that sort of section I think talks about assimilation to America, you know, to Americanized culture. You know, when you come from the island, you you have to assimilate right? They don't want you to speak Spanish, you have to speak English, you have to eat American foods, um, right? And sort of losing your cultural identity. I think maybe that was I, possibly part of that. Yeah, I kind of thought that this is not the opposite, but that the fruit represent, represented something that was pure and pure 
but also organic to the family um, because there are some changes that will happen in the next chapters or it starts in this chapter where the family starts to, the family structure starts to break apart. And I thought that the fruit sort of represented something that is fresh and new and presented, you know, presented as something that is like almost innocent, you know. Well, there is that, you know, that innocence, right? I haven't, like I said, I only read the first chapter, but there is that certain sense of innocence when you leave in your homeland and then you come to the States and then you come to New York, that it's almost like a very harsh reality from what yeah. I've been told for certain people, right? It doesn't matter how old, how young, yeah, how old or young you are, there's something I think in the past couple of years, as I get older, you know, you see how much certain countries have gotten more influenced by, you know, U.S. culture. I'm gonna let that go. <laughs> Seriously, you know, it's summer in New York, whatever that song is, that Puerto Rican song. Nueva 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 Nueva. York. Yes, <laughs> that is exactly what's happening right now. You too. But anywho, <laughs> anywho but. It, it, it gets on my nerves. But anywho, but there is that innocence that's lost. And you see it. And you see people like, whether they're here five years or 10 years, sort of talk about like that transition, whether it's difficult or not. But it's like, even if they're an adult in their country, there's still a sense of innocence that's lost when you come here, because life could be a little bit more harsher or more faster. It doesn't have to be harsh, but it could be fast. Yeah. So I well, concur. even in the book, the innocence, you don't even have to move to lose that right. innocence where she right. moved over to um, Santurce. Mm -hmm. That's when she lost some of that innocence even then. So it's just right. like moving through to because another the father state. is cheating or has some yes, Can we get into that, please? <laughs> uh, you know, I didn't want to oh, get into it. Yeah. Yeah. But My can we that also you brought that up because <laughs> the whole <laughs> stereotype of the hero. I mean, all she had to do was move from Toa Baja. I know the t the area, the barrio that she writes about, I know it well, oh, cool. I was just there this weekend. Okay. And it's it's kind of like um, rural. It's not that, it's not in the country, it's not in the mountains, but it's still a barrio, it's a small like uh, village. <clears throat> um, and then to go from there to the middle of the of the capital, Santusa is right in the middle of, of the capital, and then she was the outsider. Um, she was considered the Hibara. The Hibara is like the hick, you know, that you don't know anything. Um, and that, you know, and she found herself to be an outsider um, very quickly in school and, and, and in everything that, that she, all the people that she interacted with. So it wasn't such a big, the shock wasn't moving to New York. The shock was moving out of Macum to Santusa. También, yeah. Do we agree that the definition, I'm glad you said um, how we're defining Hibaro, right? Because we, we also use Hibaro to like to say pretty much a hick or somebody who is very- um, Unpolished. Moving, yes. Backwards. Moving. From the mountains. Backwards, that's a good adjective. That is excellent. So I just but, wanna make sure that we're on the same page. But we don't use that term but like you know that what they say? now. Yeah, she might she writes in the book, though, about the Hibara uh, that I was puzzled on page 13 at the very top of the page. She okay. says, even at the tender age when I didn't yet know my real name, I was puzzled by the hypocrisy of celebrating a people everyone looked down on. Right. So I wondered about Absolutely. That. Um, <laughs> I wondered about that. And even she says our grandparents called themselves hibaros like people around us but at the same time my mom said you're not that so it was that was, that part was very interesting uh. to me, trying to navigate that space of growing up where uh you're not quite sure where you fit in yet more specifically i think a couple pages after that she talks about how everyone has a nickname yeah right <laughs> not that. only yeah, I love that too, actually. I really like that. Um, wow. We used to call my brother Raisinhead. <laughs> we were mad. But that even with like, 
<laughs> when they're describing okay so this book for me this is oh my essentially God. my whole family right <laughs> shout and the thing is i was born and raised here in the bronx I know. but <laughs> i felt this book like I, it was my i was like this is me this is our whole I family know, right here I you know <laughs> so i'm like um so when they started to talk about the hebados there's always such a negative connotation to that it's like i you know, like, it's just like, you don't want to be associated with that type of human being. It's almost like here, it's like a classist thing up over there. I don't know. Yeah, yeah. But I forgot what we were talking about because I'm so excited about this fucking book. Um, <laughs> what were you saying? I'm sorry. I, Br the Br nicknames. Uh, oh, so oh, when yeah, they're Ricky. describing my mom trying to describe my family to me she was like well tata was this person pero pito was that human being and her real name was elizabeth pero we used to call her you know calming and it's like who is who lady i don't know who you're talking about it's just too much it's like a whole tree in itself true it's true it's yes. crazy yes. Anyways, but and I don't know if that's just a, a, a colored people thing because I'm really not trying to be funny, y'all. I had no, I have an uncle, I had an uncle whose name was Smokey. I had no idea oh. what his real name was until he died. Like, Same. and I seen it yeah. on the uh, like, uh, yep. pamphlet at his funeral. And I was like, oh my God, <laughs> like I had no idea because he was just always Smokey. like, I never heard anyone call him anything differently, like ever. And so it was, that part was really interesting to me, but also kind of how it wasn't just um, a nickname for the sport of having a nickname. The way she kind of separated it was the people that love you and the government. Mm -hmm. I thought that was a really, the line was kind of thrown in there. I thought that was really interesting. Um, the way your family perceived you instead of outside. Because mm -hmm. I was called Tata, my brother was called Papo, my other brother was called Kochi, but some members of the family didn't have those names. I don't know why, but it's like, but outside of the family, no one knew you as Tata or Papo or, you know, Paco or whatever, but I think- But then, but then the alternative, own. the alternative was because your real name was Carmen de Rosario de Maria <laughs> Gonzalez Gutierrez, you know, so that you're not gonna go through that, Coja Tata, you know? <laughs> That is, is, is so it, true. In Los Angeles. <laughs> is it possible that the nicknames came out of many people in the same families having the same names? Like there might be a, a bunch of Johns or Jose's oh. or Peter's, Pedro's. And to, dis, to, to distinguish, true. you have to give people nicknames. Well, remember, what? she was called Negi because they called her Negrita. So it's also yeah. a matter of um, it's you know, an identifier. Certain attributes that you right. have. And I, like, I, yeah. I'm sorry, Marta. I, I still take exception. And somebody, I think when we read um, Daughters of the Stone, so, someone tried to justify nicknaming people based on skin tone and they said that in puerto rico that's that's a term of endearment yeah and and i feel like it's a term of endearment that comes out of colonialism mm. I'm it depends going... how you say it <laughs> if you that say it endearingly to... i said we had an uncle called negro I, I he was, you know but if you say mira se negro you know, it depends how you say it. Yeah, but no, it's, it depends how you say it, but I've never been a fan of being called Negrita or Morena. You know, like I've never been a fan because of that. Like, I'm the, sorry, really quickly, can you just describe those two, like the difference between those two words just really quickly? Yeah. I've never heard the second one that you just said. Morena. Oh, Morena, <laughs> you know, you're, you're black. It's like um, big pun song. It's a color. Like, no, I think I think Morena is like if you're mixed, brown. right? Like a mulata. Oh, mulata. Mulata. No. Okay. Morena is brown. Brown. It's a color. It's a color. In, in Spain, they call uh, if the hair is a morena. When they're talking about hair, they're talking about a dark hair, brown hair. So it's technically the color. 
Um, and it depends, right? Right? Because, and mm -hmm. you know, we could all speak Spanish and what it means, Morena in different places is gonna be different, right? I'll be honest, mm -hmm. only, it's only been a, a, a Boricua who's called me Negrita. I don't like that. When I go to DR, it's like, Morena, Morena, Morena. I hate that too. <laughs> If you're in Honduras, morena. Mira esa morena o mira ese negro. I do not like it. But it happens. <laughs> Sorry. Miss <laughs> um, Rosemary? What's yes, yes. Thank you. Thank you, Ron. I'm so excited about this. So, yeah. with regards to things, um, I remember my mom and her family, they would call my, one of my aunts was, um, my mother was Chita. She didn't, she didn't appreciate that. That is what they called her. Um, my, my aunt was La Charanga. So it had something to do with possibly being named the same name amongst family members. That could be it. But I found it very interesting that amongst my friends, their aunts and uncles had like this special nickname amongst the family. And they were goofy names. I'm like, yo, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not a hick, right? That in my eye, it was okay. like, those are country people giving hey. people crazy names, right? That was my attitude. Born in <laughs> now, regarding the um, negro, negrita, um, in my family, my mom would refer to my dad as negro, right? Like it was a term of endearment and my dad would call her negra. Now check it. My mom is white and blue eyes, like far from the islands, but you wouldn't think like she was always confused with being like she was Jewish or something when she came to the Lower East Side. So it was always a term of endearment. However, wow. if I would hear amongst the family or commenting when they said Ese Nietzsche, that was derogatory. Ooh. In regards to calling someone by their skin color. That, that's how I knew that there was a difference. Um, yeah. So when it comes to names and terms of endearment, there was always that distinction, either by tone or specifically a particular word. It mm -hmm. could have come from Thank colonialism. I mean, oh, no. it definitely did. Yeah. I mean, absolutely. I mean, everything that is related to black people is comes from colonialism. Like, it's just, cause why else? Do we walk around calling people uh, whitey? Yeah. You know what I'm saying? Like. I mean, but yeah, like, I do. Unless it's derogatory. If I call you whitey, and it's because I'm being mean, you know, it, I'm not gonna say it because it's fun. Like, oh, girl, look at that whitey over there. No, like it's no. But I'm if you had a nickname that's whitey, like I remember the Bowery Boys back in the day, they used to call them whitey and dissy and well, yeah. There is racism in Puerto Rico. Yes, there is. Don't be yeah. What was the Big book time. we read where it was like a, a, it was like a, they were in the Bronx or Harlem. I think they were Puerto Rican or Dominicanos and like the guy. I think it was Daughters of the Stone. No, no, no. It was after that. It was a male lead. What, 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 what book was that, y'all? I facilitated. Oh, um, something about Tom. Bo Bodega Dreams. Bodega Dreams. Bodega oh, Dreams. Him? I remember in Bodega Dreams. I want to say the girl, I want to say her name was Blanca. Blanca yeah, and right. the other it was, yes. it was That's right. In right. relation to her sister, who was Negra. the dark spirit. Right. Yeah, yeah. exactly. Her name was Negra. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's right. It's like <laughs> somebody. Oh, why must, right. And the fact that she stabbed someone and Blanca was, remember, the very angelic, like, yeah. uh, you know, like there was there you go. polarism the there. Chow, let's get into it. So Ron, I definitely, Ron, you own it. You own it because definitely, but, but in this book, I don't feel that at all. I don't know if that's just me. It's even the way the mom explained her name. Um, she's like, we call you yeah. that. It just means that we love you. Where is it at? And then, but then she asks like, wait, does that mean I'm black? Like when she says yeah. like, your name is Negrita. She's like, wait, so that, does that mean I'm black? Like, yeah, I think it's was, in page 13. Brandon, it's at the bottom yeah. of page 13. Mm -hmm. It's a sweet name because we love you, Negrita. Oh, yeah. yeah, yeah. But she says, because when you were little, you were so black. Mm -hmm. My mother said you were Negrita. And I have a feeling that she's actually not that black. She's just... Um, she's olive. I more, right. I, exacto. <laughs> she's like, you know, she's like, 
she was toasted by the sun slightly, but not quite, <laughs> you know. Not I feel the that. We call that café con leche. Right, right. Más café we, que leche. Yeah, yeah. You would just start it wrong. <laughs> Y'all started. <laughs> well, blame it on Columbus. <laughs> but, but, no, I can't really, oh, go ahead. No, I was just going to go back to how the father is betrayed in the book, which which leads them to leave the the barrio and go to the city because the father they break up as a couple. The, the parents break up. They separate. But it's it's. <laughs> it's presented as though like all the men are this way and because they, all... they are <laughs> because they are because he's a sin vergüenza sin vergüenza but what do you but what do you say in english martha because i don't speak spanish um without have no shame, shame. she oh, uses okay. the word she uses the word over and over in the in but there's a like there's a whole city of mistresses like waiting for husbands to take them away from their from their wives. I no, that was, no. Oh. Yes. And they all yes. got that J Lo pussy. Ooh. All of them. All of them. Oh, I'm sorry. I am so sorry. Yeah, I yeah. used the P word. Right, it's all good. Martha. Um, very interesting. Does anyone agree with what Ron just said? What? What did he repeat? Yeah. I see it every day. <laughs> Yeah, well, I think I'm not like saying Latin that all men cheat. have a have a reputation, right? Latin book, men have a reputation. Early on, right. Early on in the book, that's kind of how it's framed. It was cultural, I think. It's I, I cultural. It could be cultural. I remember my maternal grandmother would say that her father <laughs> had uh, mistresses like on the block from each other. And, um, grandma had half brothers. You could you couldn't count them on her hand. That's how many she had. And <laughs> something that I was like, Grandma, for real? She says, Yeah. I go, How's that possible? And they knew of each other. Yeah. You know, like, I, I never heard from grandma like there was like some bitter rivalry. It was just that grandpa was a rolling stone, and that's what he did. If you have you know, stepsisters or stepbrothers, mm -hmm. there you go. In Detroit, or maybe in the Bronx too, but I know in Detroit they call they would call like um, Negrita and Negi and Maggie Project Twins, like mm. we, like they were literally born with any oh yeah yeah by different <laughs> fathers. That's what you call them in Detroit, Project Twins. And it seems <laughs> like you know I just this is so interesting to me that this could be cultural. Let's dive into this a little bit because Ooh. you know I was just watching this show if you guys haven't seen it it's called mayor of east town it is amazing <laughs> um yes. at the and in part of the show um someone a little boy is so distraught that his father is having an affair and he finds out about it and he's he's young he's like 12 or 13 and he is like beside himself sorry greg spoiler alert <laughs> i'm not gonna give you all <laughs> I'm not gonna give it all away, but this little boy is beside himself, right? And I, I, I can understand that, right? If you're, you know, just now realizing what an affair could be, and you're watching your dad go through it, and he's just, it breaks him up inside, and you know that reaction, right, of of mm -hmm. one person watching their family kind of being torn apart in a sense from an affair, not even a project twin situation, just an affair, with kind of like comparing that to this situation where Negrita finds out she has a sister and she's like dreaming about playing with her. She's dreaming about the life uh -huh. they could share. And the fact that she's older than her is even more enduring. She mm -hmm. wants to see her. She's asking, she's being quiet and hush hush uh, around the mom about it, but she's asking her dad, oh, like, where, when can I see my sister? That idea of it kind of um, what Rosemary and what um, Miss Evelyn were saying about how, you know, having half sisters and half brothers, maybe it's not that taboo in, in other parts of the world. Like, what do y'all think about that idea? Like, what do y'all think about that? Um, There's nothing to think about. We experienced it. We both experienced it. Yeah. My dad, We've experienced it, you know? My dad, um, who is a college professor, PhD, you know, with, with very intelligent, name. is now married three times. I am one of seven siblings, one of which was, you know, 
what what caused the demise of his second marriage. So we all live it. Mm. Is that that? I I find that interesting how depending on what your social status was, because I this is an interesting book. I haven't I think I read it, but I'm gonna I'm gonna listen to it on Audible. But <laughs> it's interesting that you guys bring this up or that the author brings this up because in my family on both sides you had my grandfather my great grandfather on maternal side he was a rolling stone he had just kids from the neighborhood women right and it seemed that the women accepted that or some crazy stuff my grandmother's sister she used to call the other woman la rana the frog or the toad i didn't know what a rana was and i didn't even know that she was referring to that but she take her 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 she take her husband back, right? So it didn't seem they that money. they were angry. However, on my father's side, he was a love child. That's how dad explained it to me. Okay. And he was looked down upon. He didn't have his father's name until much older. And I went to visit a couple of years ago and my heart was broken when I learned that my father, my grandfather's wife wanted to see who my father was and kind of asked her her niece to walk with that young man in front of the house and for me i felt humiliated for my father because she was like he was on display and that bothered me it was like you know that just so i think it's depending on social status that or or that women accept it or they're embittered by it, and the kids are the ones that pay for it. Uh, Ms. Evelyn, you've been wanting to chime in for a minute. Thank you for that. I, I am, I'm sorry if I jump in because I just jump out of my skin. Um, so I apologize if I have tripped on anybody else's words. Uh, but, you know, the underlying thing about this, and we're, we're, we're experiencing that in our families from past generations, but what got me was the, you know, the impact of women of the lack of birth control. Um, so this, this was it. It was, it was the minute that you hooked up with somebody, you got pregnant. So there was a product, there was proof of your husband's infidelity. There was proof of, of whatever, you know, whatever you had. And, and I remember the book, um, her mother has a lot of kids, one after the other. And I'm sure that they had other siblings as well, uh, besides that first daughter. Um, so think of, uh, if, if you know anything about the history of Puerto Rico, Puerto Rico was the, the, the experiment on uh, women for, sterilization. for uh, birth control, for sterilization. I mean, there was forced sterilization. They, it, everything was going on around this time um, that they're talking, uh, that she's talking about. And yet, um, you know, there was no birth control. So yes, there were a lot of brothers and sisters that you didn't know about. So I remember in my family, you have to know who the parents were because you don't want to be dating your cousin or your brother. <laughs> <laughs> or you know, somebody out there that might be blood related to you uh, because of that that was going on. And I would I would also say I only read like I'm like Myra, I only read the guava part, but <sighs> in the whole conversation that you um that you all are talking about, I would also probably say that um because of the reliance on the father, right? Because he was the yeah. worker and he was so it was like mm -hmm. that was just kind of pacified and accepted. Yeah because they didn't they wouldn't want to vocalize that and kind of put everything in jeopardy yes you're right willie and um one thing really quickly that ron always says or always used to say um you definitely can come and have conversation here you don't have to read the full pages don't feel like you have to or or anything like that because as you can see um the conversation is is bigger than the book right so i just want to to re-mention that but also kind of picking back off picking back off of what willie just said you know the father he he was you know obviously having some other marital affairs but you need to think about it. Maggie was older than all of the other kids. So I wonder about that. I wonder if he, if, if maybe the mother was a second or a third. Um, 
woman that he had started a family with. And so I could understand it if um, Maggie was younger than, uh, than Negrita, but she, she's not. Um, but also, also the, uh, that idea of him coming and, and fixing things. I think there was that one scene where they're, he, they're fighting and she's like, you haven't given me any money for, for the groceries, but you're out, you know, gallivanting with who knows what, all type of puntas and all like these people at the clubs and the bars having a gay old time, but like we don't have any money for food and your shoe, the, your kids don't have shoes, you know? So I think that like, I wonder how how reliant on them, on him were they really? You know, if if he's not providing even the basic necessities, um, I, I wonder about that. You know, that idea of um, maybe just wanting that masculine energy, maybe not even needing him around, but well, even yeah. that masculine energy around. Do you know what I'm saying? Because there's a point where she throws out all of his clothes and throws water on them, and then she cleans yes. them before he gets home. You Only know? water? <laughs> <laughs> well, in New York, they threw bleach. <laughs> I think she throws water on them. No, I know, but it's, it's an old tune. Mm -hmm. Seriously, and it still goes on. I had a friend, a good friend who was married to a, a Caribbean, I'm not gonna say of what background, and he would go to his country to be with his <laughs> other family. And then he would come back to my friend and they had children and they had a family. So as long as you know the bills were paid and the love was there, they could share it. I could never do something like that. But you know, there are women who have that, that fortitude I, I'll call it fortitude because, damn. I never felt that he didn't love her. I'm sorry, Maida. I never felt that he didn't. I, okay, I know this sounds, hold on before y'all come for me. Okay, yeah. Love, yes, we know, bell hooks. Thank you for opening my eyes. Love and abuse cannot coexist. What, one moment. Um, but, you know, I never felt that he didn't um, love her, you know, the way he cared for the house, even he might have not had a lot, but you know he did care for the home. He built the home, and there's something about a man with tools. So that might have been it. He might have been slinging two type of tools: a hammer and something else. <laughs> of course. Okay. Can, Where do you think those kids that. came from? <laughs> yeah, because she was pregnant again. Like she's yeah. over and over. And what I was gonna say is, is that you know. Um, <clears throat> It, it still happens today. I don't know to what extent, but I also think it might just be generational, right? Right. If you see your mom do it and you see your mom do it um, and you see your grandmother do it, because that's what I've seen in my family. And I'm like, I have half siblings. We don't like using that word half siblings, but my father too was a rolling stone. Um, and Monique could testify to that. <laughs> I have siblings that were born the same year. And I say siblings over us. Mm -hmm. um, so you can't you you see it and it becomes the norm. I think, and I haven't gone into the book, but it seems that in some cases, right, it's it it, it became normalized. So I know we could be affronted about it, but in some societies and in some pueblos or small towns, it's normal. And then there's there could also be that primary family, right? That's the primary family, like. Not to pat myself on the back, but I know that myself and my sister, quote unquote, are the primary family. My father's days are long gone, but there's the primary family. And then there's, I don't want to be disrespectful, but then it's like, you know, who, it's what happens when people pass, right? And I think people try to put their oh, paper. Yeah. You, you got to line up, you know, my house in Honduras is under my mom's name. Right, because it's, she only had two kids, and I have seven siblings. So it's like, how do you, how do you, how do they settle that type of thing? It's become, it's normalized. It's like, oh, that's it. that's my brother, that's my sister. You don't go into the halves, and that's, that's just because we've seen it over time. So I think he, for them, from what I'm hearing, it sounded like until they separated that could have been considered the primary family, even though he was doing his dirt elsewhere. True that. It looked like though the women who was out there, you know, spreading love were looked down upon as opposed to him. It was just like, oh, like you said, 
that's just what men do. But with women, it was like, ah, oh, she's a puta. There was actually a distinction between a puta and a, what was the other word? Amona. Yeah, it was just like, you are either like, you know, you either sleeping with somebody's married husband or you sleeping with everybody. But it was still like this negative no. connotation as opposed to with him, it was just like, oh, well, you know, that's the what they do. The harmona wouldn't sleep with anybody. She didn't get married. She was just like a spinster. I was the spinster. Yeah. Era yeah. corteja, que no usó la palabra. And I think there's a difference when you have children, right? Even though you could still be a puta and have children. But when you bring children into the equation, now it's a relationship, right? right. It's no longer, you know, I, my sister hates this word, right? You have the wife and then you have the girlfriend, right? And my, my sister's always like, no, that's the mistress. What girlfriend? Like it's giving them a title, a better title of what they are. Because I hear In that- Puerto Rico is la chilla. La, la chilla. chilla. <laughs> or la corteja. <laughs> yeah, but once you bring children into la the chilla. equation, you oh can't be as dismissive about it to a certain extent. Because men can have five kids with you, no offense, Ron, and all the men in this call, um, and then have four <laughs> kids with somebody else. That's a relationship. It's now that's a relationship. Right. That's Facts a right there. Yes, you know, that, that is a relationship. So a back and forth relationship, but a relationship, a relationship. nonetheless. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Open door policy. What did y'all think about that? Like everything that we're saying, kind of in relationship to the um the hen. The hen that laid the eggs that then they they cooked them and they ate them. Like so. Like I get what you're saying when children comes in, when children come into the equation, things are different. But what do y'all think that that had any connection um, with this situation? Connection, of course, it was a connection. That's a great observation, Brandon, because I wasn't even thinking about that hen. <laughs> <laughs> it, 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 the hen like comes and goes, and they're they're peeking in on it, and then leaving and then eventually they eat the they eat the the eggs and i thought about that in the sense that the mom really didn't like um the the mistress hello like she ate, yeah big beef with her so it wasn't accepted it definitely wasn't accepted you know they thought about her she didn't appreciate it she didn't accept that her man was stepping out on her at all um didn't but she I just, though i don't know she took exception. Didn't she accept it? Accept it? She <laughs> might have. She might have beefed I mean, about it, but mm. at the end of the day, she accepted it. She didn't scratch her eyes she out. She got pregnant again, and then she and moved over. out, and <laughs> then came back and got pregnant again. Again, that's makeup. So makeup stuff. She absolutely accepted it. She might have not liked it, but she accepted that. She might have not had a choice. Exactly. But there you go. Me. I don't know if it was. Oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead, Ms. Sherry. I'd like to go back. You know, having children with someone doesn't really make a relationship. You know, there are different levels of relationship. It could just be still casual. You may have a, uh, what is it called? A agape love or eros and all the other types of love within that relationship. But having children doesn't necessarily mean it's um, what we deem a positive relationship. It could but be, I, be abusive. You may be mistreated. You know, if you're the secondary family or the whatever part you are. So mm -hmm. um, I think relationship needs to really be sort of defined. You know, because just having children that really doesn't mean anything. You know. But when you have four children, though, I think that that's what we were saying. I'm sorry, Ron. When you have four kids, there is some. Okay, so like, even if we're thinking about what was that, it, what, you know, when you're thinking about timelines, you know, we're talking about being with someone for at least three and a half, four, four or five years. There is absolutely some sort of relationship there. Like you said, it may not be a healthy one, but there is absolutely a relationship. Now, maybe a one offer, like maybe, you know, then that's different. That might've just been, I'm just hitting it and it just so happens. But four kids, there's something there. There's something. And I guess in that sense, you know, what what amount of time is he actually spending in child rearing? Is he providing financially? Those types of things. I don't know. But I'm just thinking relationship. Yes, it could be four kids, but what what is that father figure? Is he like a, a 
just the imagination and the kids' imagination is that we have a father or do they, does he really know them? Does he spend time with, quality time with them? How does he balance all of that? This is the 1950s. We got to keep yeah. that in mind. So we're thinking with modern, you know, perspectives here and the, the 1950s men in general, no matter whether they were in Puerto Rico or on the east side of Manhattan, treated, treated women differently. Yeah, yeah. Different circumstances, socioeconomic conditions and all that jazz. But yeah, I, I also agree with Marta. If you have four children, that's a relationship. You might not, neither one of you may acknowledge it, but you you in a relationship. That's, that's <laughs> I guess commitment. I thought about it. I don't know. I don't know. I, just, I guess I Some thought kind. about it. Mm -hmm. I'm not saying it's positive. Yeah. But <laughs> you're making a commitment to someone <clears throat> like long term. <laughs> like four <laughs> times. <laughs> this book. At least. Maybe, but maybe. In the sense of this book, how it's so cl closely connected uh, with nature. Um, that terrifying scene where the she like gets eaten alive by the termites. Oh God, that made my skin crawl. But like how this book is so closely connected with nature. <laughs> and I've never been in a hen house before, but what's that term like cock in the hen house? There's like one cock and then there's a bunch of hens and then it's the same cock that like impregnates all of the hens. <laughs> like, I'm sorry, but like I, this kind of has that same vibe yeah. here where Poppy is the cock. And the hens are just like laying eggs all willy nilly, <clears throat> but like I don't know if I would consider the a commitment to any of them. I don't know if there's. I think that's what this kind of family well, that's, lacks is an actual commitment. In commitment and relationship, cock, two different yeah, words. In the sense that the cock is just kind of going Cocking. around, you know, planting his seed, planting his seed, <laughs> and the hens are there with are stuck there if you will with the eggs until what until somebody until they you know warm them enough that they can hatch or until somebody comes along and eats them yeah but and if he's a good cock right sorry but if he's a good cock right i hate that <laughs> uh, i guess you say it so beautifully uh, though <laughs> but know, you say it one more time <laughs> I'm, I'm blushing over here i know right <laughs> But if he is, right, you see that he's a hardworking man, he's taking care of his family, you're going to want that too, right? So what's like one more or two more, right? I think that comes into play, right? With somebody who's going to take that second or third or fourth position is like, well, he's a good man because da 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 da, -da. He's going to build my floors eventually. Yeah. Right, eventually. No, we can't let it go either. It could just be dang on this straight out sexual desire, just sexual, just, mm, I like this, I want to keep doing it, I want to keep doing it, I want to keep doing it. He, loved so, he was romantic too, because he was reading her a poem, poem remember, back in, um, in Santuse when she left, and, oh, that's what I wanted to talk about. He was a stoop dad for a little bit. I don't know if anyone's ever seen Kevin Hart's special, but he talks about his dad being a stoop dad where he wouldn't be allowed to cross that threshold. But then eventually, and that's what he was for a moment because she was so mad at him. And then eventually he, you know, eased his way into back into her life. And he let, she let him cross that threshold. Yeah. And, you know, he was doing poems for her and all this other stuff. So he might've also not only been a good lover or maybe the only, but he was romantic. And he was- That's good another with thing that was her only one too. Oh, I don't know about the rest of it. Don't tell me, Anna, don't tell me. You can chime in with Evelyn. So um, Ron, you, you just said about, you know, going back to the 50s. Uh, one of the reasons that Puerto Rico was given its status is because they had a lot of men that could be drafted into the service. And this was World War I, World War II, the Korean War. 50s was the Korean War. There were there is now, I know that, is, they say that about 20 women for every one man in Puerto Rico right now. Um, so competition is very high. Um, imagine what it was in the 50s when all the men were being shipped out of the island uh, for, to fight in the Korean War. Um, so if you had a man, 
you tried your best to keep him no matter what he did. Uh, you put up with a lot of shit. Uh, and if you didn't have a man and that man was taking care of his family, wow, imagine what he could do in take care, in, taking care of me. So there was a lot of competition at that time. Mm -hmm. and, and, this, and that still exists. That hasn't changed here. I'll tell you that. Good point. It's a small island. I mean, you could drive. Oh, that's a great point. It's a small island. <laughs> you could drive the entire island one day. 35 miles by 100 miles. <laughs> that's it. That's it. It's a small island. De un lado al otro. And it was smaller for them during the 50s. Right. 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 And I'm, I'm assuming all of the all these relationships or the the breaking up of the relationships is what leads to um, Negi and her family. I don't know exactly who comes to America, but because already parts of her family are already migrating to mm -hmm. New York. So it just you feel the inevitability of them moving here i don't think in the chapters that we read they haven't moved to new york yet ron so, ron I, I, that I'm, was I'm, the time I, of the great di diaspora i'm not giving anything away <laughs> no but but that was technically historically the time yeah. of the great migration mm -hmm. um from from the island because people were starving it, there was a lot of poverty and a lot of mm -hmm. hunger and the mm -hmm. opportunities in New York was, you know, all you needed was one person, like every immigrant, all you needed is one person to make that first trip to be the pioneer. And right after that, the, you know, everybody's coming over and they all staying in the same apartment. But, exactly. you know, that's how they, that's how it happened for many of our, you know, um, in other immigrant families. And mm -hmm. it was the same for Puerto Ricans as well. And they would get clothes from the New Yorkers. It's so, what's yeah, my story. Was, uh, you know, I want to live in America. Okay, by being America. But I think that they were lured here. Weren't they lured here um, with the promise of work? There was like something, a very oh, yeah. specific luring of Puerto Rican men to New York City. Big um, tomatoes. The streets upstate. were paved with gold. It was like the farmers that came. Some It was had something to do with farming. Right. right. Tomato picking up, up in Hudson Valley. And there was a lot of factory work in those times. And the sugar, the domino factory. Mm -hmm. That's when the women started coming because of the factories, the seamstresses. I mean, at that time, yeah, well, that's, that's, my, yeah. well, that's how my mother put me through college. Uh -huh. uh, she sewed, you know, she was sewing piecework, a, a pack for five cents a piece. <laughs> I don't know well, how she did it. Oh, wow. But that's so interesting because that was at yeah. the Operation Bootstrap when Americans went and destroyed the agricultural economics of Puerto Rico, built factories, gave them a job for a year, then shut the factories down. History. And her mother is a seamstress, isn't she? Of some sort. It seems like she's always, she's sewing something a few times um, in yeah. her 60 pages. Um, I so think that's, that's just par for the court. Like that's who you are. You just have to know how to sew. You, if you're, if you were born and raised there, I think <laughs> that's you true. have to know how to sew. And I, think other... that's part, I think that's part of home ec in, in the Caribbean. Country. They don't <laughs> yeah. do it as much now, but I feel like every female oh, of right. a certain generation knows how to sew. How knows how to do? It's not knitting in the traditional word. Yeah, it's no. crochet. Crochet. Just sew. Okay. Just you, sew learn in, you learn that in school. You learn uh -huh. how to crochet and you learn how to sew. So a lot of females, yeah. including my mother, when they moved to the States, found jobs as seamstress because that's what was taught in the schools in yeah. the Caribbean. And I think also like you're dressing all those kids you're having. So that's really <laughs> like what you're doing. Yes. You, you go yeah. buy the material, right? You, I mean, mm -hmm. they don't have it anymore, but you used to just go to um, patterns, my like patterns. My they patterns. still have patterns. They have the McCain and the Vogue. Really? They Where? Vogue, not in the same extent they have them. In not the in Woolworths. Remember Woolworths? Oh my not God, Woolworths. Y'all. Woolworths on Southern Boulevard and Hurst Point. That's yeah, my place. Pa, that's when that's Batman it. came with the Batmobile. No. I'm laughing too because I have a, I, I won't show you, but in my kid bed, 
in my bedroom, my sewing machine is out. It's right there because I sew almost every day. <laughs> What is a and sewing that's machine? something that I hadn't done in a long time. And it was my mother's sewing machine. And when I came to Puerto Rico, I said, oh, what's that in the corner? Oh, mommy's sewing machine. I took it out and it's been out ever since I arrived. Um, so yes, it is part of our culture and our yeah. heritage. This was something that the women did. Beautiful lacing. I think Mondillo. Laz wants to say something. ¿Cómo se dice? Yeah, I think you're, you're, you're brought up something that I think you overlook when when they was building the hotel there, I think a lot of people got displaced. And this is right before the embargo in Cuba, which opened up a lot of tourism in the Caribbean. And I think a lot of Puerto Ricans was coming to New York because they was being displaced on the land. And she didn't understand it as a child, but they was talking about this. She says, well, who, who's, where are we gonna go? She said, well, you know, we're not gonna stay here. They was building a hotel. The Rockefellers were building a hotel. That's when they said all Americans was coming. That's true, that's true. Yes, you're right, you're right taking over so she's bringing up a lot of you know the historic aspects of when a lot of puerto ricans was getting displaced and they and it was easy to come to america because you didn't need a passport all the other caribbean islands you needed a passport right. you were considered an immigrant coming to america and you know what's really interesting about this book compared to the last book we read dominicana where it the history is laid out it's on the page in front of us whereas with this book um the history what's going on it's, it's, the people are living it, right? And you mm -hmm. just have to know the history and to kind of place it in here. But the fact that during this time, a lot of kind of forced sterilization was going on, but the mother was having, you know, kind of kid after kid after kid. Um, that was really interesting to me. If you didn't know that history, you wouldn't really be able to relate the two of them. The same with what Loss just said. Like, if you didn't know that wasn't going on, that was going on at the time, you wouldn't know how to really navigate the, the material. So I really like, I mean, I really liked how, what Angie did in Dominicana, how she kind of laid the history out for us. But I really like how it's done in this book as well, um, just on a craft point of view, really quickly, like how um, the history, this, the history doesn't need to be blatantly said. It's just what is going on with this family at the particular time. Yep. Yeah, Miss Evelyn. So I think that was the part that bothered me the most of, about the, the way her writing style is. It's snapshots. I didn't get a sense of history. And so you really nailed it there. I, I, it bothered me that the, there was no sense of continuity. It was just snapshots of, of flashbacks of what she remembered. And um, I miss that. I, I, in my, when I read, I'd like to see continuity. So to me, that was a, that was a problem. Mm. Yeah, I feel that. I feel that. Any other, um, I'm glad that we have this group reading this book, though, because we get, between all of us, we can kind of share the history, the knowledge that we know and kind of piece it together. Mm -hmm. um, there was a line that I thought was, uh, that she asked during the funeral that was just so profound to me. Um, it's on page 53. And even if you didn't read all the way mm. here, like, what do y'all think about this line? She, she asks, what does a soul do? And the answer is, oh, yeah. it goes to live with Papa Dios in paradise. And then she asks, when people are alive, what does the soul do? <laughs> that was so mm -hmm. profound to me because it, uh, there was an innocence in it. There was a, a very serious innocence, but a very serious curiosity. Um, like, what do y'all think about that? How would you even begin to answer that question? I laugh because that it was asked to me this weekend by a little five-year-old girl at the beach because we were happy to be at the beach and the, the uh, a Pentecostal uh, ceremony was taking place with the christening in the water. And this oh. little girl who just, I don't know, I didn't know her. And she said, what are they doing? And we were trying to explain. And she said, well, what is the soul? What, que es la alma? Because she's saying, limpiar el alma. They were, they were praying over her and they were saying those words and she couldn't figure out what was alma and alma is soul. And she, pretty much kind of responded in the way that 
that she did, which is, you know, almost as if she was an empath that I, my soul walks next to me. It's not, it's not apart from me. It, it is apart from me. I, I can relate to the soul. And the little girl responded that way. And, and it's weird because I had just finished reading that chapter. And when this child, the innocence of a child, it's, it's just so refreshing um, that it makes us think. It makes us, you know, here I am 70 years old and I'm thinking, oh, wow, that's profound. <laughs> yes. I mean, I... I get a little bit shook when I am dumbfounded by questions of children, questions that children have of me that I'm just like, oh, wait, what? It kind of, it kind of scares me a little bit that, um, that I'm reflecting on such a deep question, but also that, that a question so, like that can even be coming from somebody so young, you know? It's a very innocent question, but I don't have the answer to it, you know, and it's, it doesn't, it's not like I could, I had the answer and I just don't know how to say it to a child. For example, if you are describing um, sex, what are the birds and the bees? Like, I know what that is. I just don't know how to explain it exactly to a child. It's something um, a, a lot deeper, a lot deeper that, that truly no one can really explain. But I'm wondering, what do y'all think about, about that? She also says that she walks next to herself. Mm -hmm. Like her soul, yeah. Her soul walks beside her mm -hmm. and that her soul yeah. wanders. I don't know. That sounds a lot like the, the Daughters of the Stones type of situation. Mm. Or, you know, when I read that line, I kind of thought about maybe that, that longing and that connection that she has for her other siblings, too. I kind of thought maybe that was mixed in there somehow. How old is she asking these questions? I think she's like seven. <laughs> like she's really young. Cause her and how she remembers all this is amazing. I don't know. Yeah, I think, that's, I think that's a very interesting part, too, because I was thinking, I was like, wow, like, this is a memoir, but I'm almost reading it as um, fiction. Mm -hmm. This is a memoir? Yeah. A memoir? Oh! It's a I memoir. <laughs> I have been reading this. It as, says there, a memoir. I have been reading this as fiction. And I was says, reading this like, like Dominicana. <laughs> no, it's a reading. memoir. But there are certain elements that I still recall from being, you know, at that age, if it made an impression or certain things that kind of, you know, trigger a memory. So that's what, yeah, that's what we have to keep in mind that a memoir is just your memories and your memories could be skewed way from the reality and way from the facts. But, you know, that's how you remember it. So, oh, yeah, that's true. And also, I think just the perception of an of, of an older child, a child who is the oldest of their family, um, is a lot different than, than the other children. And I, I'm the youngest, so I know that. I'm, I'm always like, what, that happened? When my siblings are, are talking, I'm, I never know what they're talking about or what's going on. You're the baby. Um, yeah, yeah. And so when she talks about her, the la her lap being stolen um, oh, yeah. after she you know, watches her mother having all of these children, um, that's I thought common. about that a lot. Like her perception of her mother having children is her lap being stolen, you know, whereas obviously her mother has a different perception of that. Her neighbors even have a different perception of that. The father does. Um, so I thought yeah. that was interesting too. Uh, memoirs by, by, ch by older children, by the oldest children are always the, usually mm -hmm. the most significant. <laughs> what I think is funny that is, her father is the one who's leading the, the novenas. The novenas. <laughs> like, seriously? So we know he's a mujeriego. Um, how do you say mujeriego in, um, in English? A womanizer. A womanizer. womanizer. So you know he's a mujeriego. He's a puto. <laughs> uh, but he's the one who's re leading the, the novenas. That It sounds so like, really? Now you're a Christian while yeah. you're doing your work? <laughs> so. No, because he reads poetry to his daughter. He's a well-versed man, so he has to... Poetry and then being, I'm going to do the novenas are two different things. I'm that's, sorry. That's a lot of reading, man. I'm going to give you the side eye. Like, you going into church is not going to fall. Like, seriously? 
And you know that that custom, Brandon, the novenas? No, I don't. What is it? <laughs> uh, okay, Evelyn. <laughs> Tell me, Evelyn. Oh, Myra, Myra, you talked about it. You threw it, baby. It's scary. And, and it passed that quickly. No, oh, it's, yeah. what is it, nine days? Nine days of prayer? Yes, yeah, nine so, days. Oh, okay. The way they described the children, that she had to, you know, carry the candle and lead the procession. I actually did that as a child. They, they rounded up when an aunt of ours died. Um, they rounded up all the all the little girls that had done their first communion, and we actually had to dress in white. And this was on Jackson Avenue and 138th Street. So um, they watched they watched her in the house in the living room, 1956, 57. They watched her in the living room, and all the little girls that had made their first communion. The wake. I'm was, sorry. So the wake was in the living room. Yeah, la velada in the living room in the Bronx. <laughs> Yeah, that was that was common. And the, can <laughs> and the candles the were put in the bathtub. A lot of the candles were put yeah. in the bathtub. Yeah. And we carried the candles. <laughs> we were all dressed in white and we led the procession. Um, and the novenario, oh, the night of the day of the burial, you don't pray. But then the next day, get ready because your house is going to be filled up to, you know, the rafters with people who will bring food. You have to, you know, have coffee. Even in Puerto Rico, the, the funeral parlors will provide you with the big thing of, of coffee and the chairs and the canopy for the tent outside because the overflow of people will, everybody won't fit in the house. Um, so, yeah, that was that triggered like you, you used the word triggered and that triggered that memory that I had totally forgotten about. Um, and that was the first time I saw a dead body in the middle of a living room, you know, um, and and it was a tradition that up yeah. until recently is still taking place here in 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 Puerto Rico with the velada in the house. Melodios with the babies, yeah. Yeah, and they cut it down. I think in Jamaica they call it nine nine, um, and we, you know, oh, people, Caribbean, people yeah. have started to cut down the nine days and just get to the day. <laughs> nine days is too long, <laughs> but I think it's because tradition's being lost. Let's be honest, right? And yeah. there are probably all kinds of laws now that prohibit <laughs> you keeping a dead body in your house <laughs> up to nine ten days. Yeah. Sure no, that. no, no, no. That the the ro rosary started the day after the burial. The mm. day after the burial, you yeah. Start you didn't keep the body in the house more than two days. Yeah, yeah. No. Okay. it's like a funeral. No, because it would be doing. real yeah. scary, and you couldn't <laughs> sleep. You could nobody. There had to be always somebody because it was if you had them in the house, you had to keep somebody up. That's why they called it awake because know, yeah, somebody yeah. had to be present okay. all day and all night while the body was still in the house yeah and when you're young that is scary i'm sorry i was scared <laughs> yeah. i don't like that that is fascinating Hard. it is it is you know it's funny um you're saying it's scary and i thought so one of the things that happened for me in this book is i remembered all the stories that my mom was saying and i how much i wished i had lived that because I'm a New Yorkian, so I never got a chance to what? live any of that. So for me, I was like, what a beautiful way to send your family off, right? I'm a New Yorkian too. They did that in the Bronx. No, uh, they didn't do that. I've never experienced that here. But <laughs> well, over there, my mom would always talk about, you know, yeah. that. Well, actually, we, I with my family, you. we never, um, we were fortunate enough that we didn't have the deaths. Uh, maybe that's probably why. And oh, whenever wow. we did bury someone, it was back home. And so I only heard of that back home. And, you know, it was, I was like, oh, it's such, such a beautiful way to send someone off. And everyone is like, no, it was scary. And I'm like, really? I think like, I want to chill with my dead somebody in the living room, really? you know? Yeah. Like, and just be like, <laughs> Thank you for being, you know, I don't know. It just seems very, it's still romantic in me. I don't know. I mean, I think that that's really <laughs> interesting, Marta, because what you're describing, I really like that because especially um, that's that idea of being someone without a mothered tongue, if you will, being someone who is, who is 
whose ancestors, right, have experienced a lot of tradition, but um, as their offspring, you don't really get a chance to experience any of that, but you kind of crave it, right? I think that that is, um, that's honestly like this, that's like Negrita's children, if you will. They're not really, they're probably not gonna experience any of that, any of those customs yeah. or traditions, because when you're born in America, yet you have the ancestry of yeah. Puerto Rico or Africa or Jamaica, that all goes away. That all kind of gets mm -hmm. lost. Go so I can totally stone. understand yeah. that idea of kind of craving that tradition that um, you, know, you don't really uh, have here. I don't know about- Isn't that the whole life. point of the book? It's a memoir. Mm -hmm. That's leaving your legacy. That is, uh, when you read something like that, you experience it if you're mm -hmm. really reading it. So to me, um, that's the whole value of, of this book and all the other books that, you know, we've been able to read through the book club because you are experiencing. So that's, that's yeah. a gift that you now are, are sharing, you know, with writers are a blessing because they're giving you a gift of an experience, especially through a memoir um, that you can um, trace back, you can learn yeah. from. Yeah. Yeah. We have um, about five minutes left. Does anyone want to say anything, um, especially anyone who hasn't spoken up yet, just want to chime in and give us um, some anything, any thoughts? You're um, doing I'll, share, really I'll share something because you guys were all talking about different customs. I was also a New Yorican. Um, <laughs> and um, my first experience was when my great grandmother passed and I was about seven. And we went back to Puerto Rico, to Carolina area. And, you know, she was, uh -huh. we, we did have her in a funeral home because her son was a sergeant at the police station. But then when it was time to bury her, we walked her through the town. And for me, I was like, what? We're going to walk her through the town? And here you just go from the funeral home to the cemetery. And no, she had soldiers carrying her, you know, his, his co-workers. They walked her through the town to the church. We had the service. Then we walked her to the cemetery. And she's buried above ground where they have those, those uh, cemetery blocks, I guess you call them. And she's buried above ground. And when we go, we go visit this block that's above ground. So for they, me, that was very foreign living in New York. Yeah. Experiencing they, that. They do something similar here. So sometimes what they will mm -hmm. do in the cars, they'll uh -huh. drive from the funeral home yes. to the past your home yes. in yeah. the cars. Right. Then to the oh, cemetery. Yeah. The procession, yeah. yeah. They still do that. And if you have the, the wreath on the on the building, you take it off and take it to the burial mm -hmm. ground. So I've done that, but I had never actually walked through the town, mm -hmm. you know, or what you know, what their central part of the town was. So I was like, wow, this is what you do. And like Martha was saying, like it would be in like an honor to be yeah. with the person who, who has passed away. So for me, I felt like it was an honor to do this, like, you know, almost like, you know, I know that Jewish, when they have Seder and so on, that you actually do something that pains you for the person that you, you lose. So for me, that was how I associated it then, even without knowing it, that this is, this is the last thing I'm doing for you in honor of you. Yes. Mm -hmm. That's great. Mm -hmm. I'm amazed that you see, I'm not from Carolina, but that you said Carolina and my family's from, from Carolina. And now I'm yeah. like, we're probably related. Yeah. We're related. <laughs> I'm almost positive. Probably. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Go to 23 and me. Right? Yeah. Yeah. That's exactly. Carolina. Exactly. <laughs> it's funny that you mentioned the reefs. I think I don't see it anymore in New York. I think growing up in the 80s, when somebody uh -huh. passed away in your building, but that's, you know, that's a different thing. You know, every, you know, where people knew each other and where people could discipline each other's mm -hmm. kids without being very offended. But you would see when people used to pass, there were always reefs. Yes. And it was, and it was mm -hmm. respected. That's the difference. Yes. Uh, you know, and, and the I, candles in the street. And, well, now, now you more see you see more candles mm -hmm. because that's the younger generation. The older generation will do reefs. Yes, but I feel even with the candle, it kind of it, it does it for me anyway. It doesn't feel the same. 
No, it doesn't. When you have the reef on, on the door, it's, it's, a, it's a community loss. When I see the candles, to me, it doesn't have the same symbolism that mm -hmm. the reef used to have. Exactly. No, and it's true. And then I recently went to a, a wake and we did the rosario, you know, the mm -hmm. rosary within it. And everyone that was responding was elder. There was very few young people. And that was like a norm. You had to learn it. You had to learn it because you were doing the rosarios in your house for the nine nights, mm -hmm. you know? And, you, you know, some people had the rosaries, some people didn't. So, you know, I remember learning how to, how to recite the rosary back when I was 10, you know? And my father passed when I was 16. So then we had it in the house. And, you know, so I made sure my mother was like, you better know, because this is your father. So you're going to answer. <laughs> you're going to be able to answer when it's time to recite mm. so i knew it from young and i still you know know it now yeah i did it two years ago my friend was like so surprised i did it for his father mm -hmm. it's, it's long i'm sorry it's long. <laughs> it's long. but it's repetitive also it's right? repetitive right yeah, yeah. you yeah. better learn that this, um kind of how this conversation has opened up to that idea of tradition being lost um but at mm -hmm. the same time that that promise of like what do you have to give up right what do you have to give up when you go mm -hmm. from one place to another something's got to give you can't bring everything with you and oftentimes mm -hmm. often i don't care where you come from oftentimes it is tradition that gets left and i just mm -hmm. think that's so interesting especially what when marta was talking about you know what i think i would like that i think i would like to sit in the in the house for a few days with my with one of my dead relatives i think that would be something comforting to me kind of that idea of having that tradition almost stripped away from you in the hopes of a better life um so yeah i just i'm just really loving how we've kind of come full circle here um mm -hmm.